scripture reading for today's word of God comes from two different places. First, Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Uh, 14, sorry. Matthew chapter 18, verse 14. 18, verse 14. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. And the second scripture comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And he entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. And was unable to because unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead. He ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has got to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I, I will give to the poor, and if I have uh, uh, defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And, and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because, because he, too, is a son of Abraham. But the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, through the two passages that uh, our elder has read, I'd like to share the message with the title, What is God's Will? And the subtitle is, The Purpose of the Believers is to Find the Lost. Today, uh, in the main passage, uh, it says that it is God's will that not even one little one is lost. And as we think about our life, uh, every human being, every person has a has an origin. We came from somewhere. Where did you come from? <laughs> where did you come from? Where, where did we come from? We came from our parents, or we came from uh, we either we have our origin. But more importantly, there is a direction where we are going. And let me ask you again, where are you going with your life? And then we have our end. Where will we end up? Each person probably has different views, different beliefs, and different hopes for their end. So for some people, their end might be their death. That's it. Some, for some people, especially for us Christians, we believe in life after death, which is uh, known as heaven or hell, right? And I pray and believe, and I pray that everyone here has the hope for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. And that's probably why we are here, and because we have that hope and belief that there is the kingdom of heaven and we want to be there, that we spend and we invest our time and our efforts and our life into this belief and, and into doing God's work. So we have our end. And the Bible tells us, Romans chapter 2, Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 through 37, that in the end, and also in Revelation, in the end, there is judgment. Judgment meaning there will be a decision made whether you will be in heaven or not. And some of those decisions will be made according to our belief and what we do. And Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, Hebrews 20, uh, chapter 9 verse 27 says, It is appointed for men, mankind, to be born once and to die. Anybody want to disagree with that? It is appointed for mankind to be born and to die. Unless we live to the day when Jesus comes back and He takes us to heaven alive. But if before that, 
we have everybody lives and dies. But after that it says there will be judgment. After this comes judgment. And so that is the basic basic truth and foundation of Christianity. Or in general, what everybody kind of understands about their life. I'm born and there will be an end. Now, what will you do? Forget uh, whether we know about our origin or not. We know that we exist. We live our life today. And then there will be an end. Everybody knows there will be an end to their life. The question is, how much do you have left? Compared to some of you, I may be older, I may be much younger. But even now, as a middle-aged man, I'm thinking, how much time do I have left? As I see my kids growing older, I look at them, you know, like they're going to be in middle school, high school, in university, or you know, adolescent, and young adult, and soon they will be adults. <coughs> that means I'll be a grand adult. Right? I'll be a grandpa. And how much time do I have left? Unless my time is terminated in the middle through some kind of accident or sickness. Even then, even if I, I live to the full, fullness of what is appointed to me, how much do I have left? And then I begin to think, what's the worthwhile thing for me to do for the remainder of my life? I'm saying this for you to kind of share and think about this too. I'm sure you think about these things every day, but uh, let's, let's just let's bear with me with my trend of thought. What will I do for the remainder of my life? Do I spend my time earning a lot of money? That's good. At least I can live a good life for the rest of my life on this earth. Is it much different in the end, after, after your life, if it, life is finished? Is it so much different whether you lived as a millionaire, you lived as a billionaire, or you lived as a day-to-day -day pocket money kind of person. Is, is it really so important for me to spend the rest of my life for? Okay? To pass down uh, some comfortable, guaranteed life for my children, yes. But then, what is really happiness for the rest of my life, remainder of my life? What will really make me happy? And when I have to die, or when I have to finish my life on this earth, really be able to say, look back and say, wow, I lived a good life. I have no regrets, I'm ready to go. What kind of life, what kind of values do I need to promote and hold? And what can, what can I do to live a worthwhile life? Because the Bible says a life consists of only about 70, 80 years. Right? Some people live longer, but then not much longer. Right? 20 years, 30 years longer, maybe. A person has values and a sense of task about what he needs to do depending on the direction they're facing depending on the end they want to see. And so if we are more than just a beast that lives according to his instincts and, and their needs day by day, moment by moment, if we can look forward to the future or prepare our future a little bit, I believe we do need to ask ourselves, what do I want to do? What do I need to do for the rest of my life? And if, uh, coming back to Christian beliefs, if we really believe that we are created by God, and in the end we are going to stand before God, in the end it is God who will give me the blessings of the kingdom of heaven, then I need to start thinking, what can I do in, relation to my, relation, in, in my relationship with God? 
or in my life as a created being that will return to him, what can I do? I don't want to say to buy his favor, but what can I do to fulfill the purpose of the creator? And the question that we can come to ask is, what does he want from me? What's his will? That's a more eloquent way of saying, what does he want? What does he want from me? What does he desire from me as a creator? I'm not, I'm not a robot. I'm not a vacuum cleaner that he made. I'm a human being, but what does he, is, does he have any desire in creating me and giving me life? And extending my life, how many of her years that is left? What do I need to do? Apart from my in, instinctive or, or daily needs, if we are to look forward to have a greater vision and greater direction of our life, I believe we need to ask that question. And as a church, we have, we have, uh, we had the blessing of dedicating this, this church. We have this beautiful sanctuary. As a church, what can we do? We exist for the will of God, right? The church. Even if individuals may not agree to that, the church exists for the will of God, to do God's work. And we talked about doing God's work last week. So first, let us ask the question, what is God's will? That's the first point, first main point. What is God's will? And please bear with me because as I go through this, you might say, hey, I know this too well. But bear with me, think through this one by one with me. First, what is God's will first? Restoration of mankind from sin and death. If I were to summarize the entire Bible, 66 books of the Bible, in one sentence, it is the restoration. God's desire to restore His mankind, His people, from sin and death. So that His people can live without the interruption, without that, that blockage of sin and death. And I believe that is called heaven. Heaven is not a place of gathering dead souls. It's not a place where ghosts float around with a smile. You know, sometimes we have uh, the image of heaven. Heaven is where all the dead souls are go, and they're just happy, doing nothing. I don't think so. Heaven is a place where we exist. We exist. We are there. But then there is no more worries of sin and death. Through, from, time, from the time of Adam to the time of the patriarchs, time of, of the, the, uh, the judges, the kings, the Babylonian captivity, the return, and the intertestamental times, and the New Testament times, throughout what God wanted to do is to restore His people. And that is called redemption. God wanted to redeem His people. Second, secondly, under what is God's will? In order to do that, God, want, God needs to forgive our sins. Take away our sins. And it is God's will for Him to come. And His name is Jesus Christ. For it is God's will for Jesus to forgive our sins. And in order for us to receive that forgiveness and to be redeemed, we have to come to Jesus. That is the absolute truth. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Romans 8, 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So it is God's will for Christ Jesus to come and to fulfill God's will of saving us, redeeming us. 
Do you believe that? Now, the key is this. For, those who need, uh, for, the, for people to be saved, what needs to happen is they need to receive this word of Jesus Christ. Believe in Him and confess Jesus is mine. Are you able to confess that today? You might be thinking, this is too easy, too simple. Yes, it is so simple that a lot of people cannot take it. I believe it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 14, today's passage. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. Jesus also said in John 6, 39, John 6, 39, This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus came to save His people. And those who believe in Him will be saved. This is the gospel. Now, what is what is it that God wishes, God wants? We asked about God's will. God's will is that little ones out there. His people are saved. Now if there is one thing that you and I would want to do in order to do God's work, what would it be? We ask the question, what does God want? God wants His people to be saved. So, as people who are saved, what would it be for us? We need to go out and find those little ones. If, if there is one thing that is worthwhile doing for the rest of our lives, is to see at least one more person be saved. So in order to fulfill that, let us go to the second main point. Jesus came and, and showed us what, how important it is and what is it that He really wants to do. What is he, His real will and desire. So second point, Jesus who came to find the lost. Jesus came to find the lost. In today's passage, our second passage in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is passing through a city of Jericho. I think I mentioned this before. In Jesus' life and ministry, Jesus sometimes goes to places randomly, it seems like. It seems like he just, he just chooses to go to Capernaum, which is, you know, which is out of the way. Jesus goes through Samaria, which is unusual. And today, Jesus is going through Jericho. And there, I mentioned, when Jesus randomly or, or sometimes goes to, goes to a place, he's, it's not just because his mood changed all of a sudden. It's not because he has no other path, but he's always looking for that one. And I believe you are sitting here today because Jesus passed through your life. And why did Jesus go to Capernaum? He went there. And then he came right back. It seemed like he had something to do. But after, what, when did he come back? After he met this woman, Canaanite woman, who was crying out, Jesus, help save my daughter. After she confessed, after she proved her faith, Jesus came right back. Why did Jesus go there? Jesus went there to meet that, that woman. Why did Jesus go through Samaria? Did he have any business in Samaria? He met the Samaritan woman. So here in Jericho, Jesus is going through the city. And the scholars say that there were about 100,000 people living in the city of Jericho during that time. And the entire city was, was just busy because I guess they liked him or Jesus was popular during that time. And they heard that Jesus is coming. And so everybody came out to the, to the streets, and among them was this man named 
Zacchaeus. We know the story about Zacchaeus really well. But let, bear with me once again. Today's sermon is something you know, but let us know it again. Is that okay? Zacchaeus was apparently a short man, very short man. And he was not liked by anybody, especially the Jews. Why? Because he was a chief tax collector. Was a tax collector. During that time, the, the Jews, the Israelites, the, the, the Judeans were under the regime of Rome. And Rome was collecting tax. And who was doing the work for, the, for Rome? Another Jew, another Jewish person named Zacchaeus or other people, they went around collecting tax from his people to give to the Romans. And he benefited from that tax. So how much would you hate a person like that? Let's say, you know, let's say another country came and, and took control over Singapore. And you have a Singaporean uh, fellow who is running around collecting your tax to give tribute to that country. How much would you love that person? And that guy became rich doing that. Very rich. That's Zacchaeus. Hate the guy. <coughs> and you wish, if Jesus is real, the real Messiah, he would come and rebuke and condemn this guy. Right? And but this Zacchaeus guy, I don't know why, because the Bible doesn't say, but from his actions, we can see how desperate he must have been. A tax collector during that time, uh, according to the Roman, Roman society and Roman rule, were above the, the Jewish people, basically. They were in between the Roman, Roman soldiers and Roman regime and the Jewish people. They were the, the little bridge. So they had that prestige. He was a rich guy, although he was short. But for him to climb that sycamore tree, because he was short, you know, when we have events, we have birthday parties or something, we, we see kids climb up, climbing up tables to look and to get closer to something. We expect that. But can you imagine one of our elders climbing up the table? Can I see? That's the kind of, you know, picture this is showing us. Zacchaeus climbing. Climbing up that tree. Why was he climbing up that tree? To even putting down his pride, his status? Was he just curious? Would he do that just out of curiosity? Now he's passing by. He, it show, his actions show us that he must have been seeking for something. That's why he climbed a sycamore tree. He's seeking on one. Tree's name is Sycamore, but it was, it was seeking things. Never mind. You know when you have to explain your own joke? That's, that's very pitiful. Don't make your pastor a pitiful pastor. Please laugh at the first one, even if it's not funny. Uh, so he climbed a sycamore tree. And you can just imagine the crowd. And Jesus is passing by. And he happens to pass by that sycamore tree. What are the chances? Of all the streets and of all the, all the sycamore trees out there, and all the people, he comes to that city, and Zacchaeus is just looking for a place to, to, you know, to look out and see Jesus. And Jesus is passing by, and he looks at Zacchaeus. And what does he say? He has Zacchaeus come down. Who told him his name? Did he meet him before? Did he send them a text message? Jesus, look for a sycamore tree. A man named Zacchaeus. That's me. I will be on it. No. Jesus passes by and he calls him Zacchaeus. Can you imagine? Put yourself in Zacchaeus' situation. Nobody likes you. 
Somehow you're put into that situation where you're doing that work. But now, maybe, maybe, right, we can see from his confession, he's repenting of this, this work that he's been doing. He's looking for a way to find forgiveness, find, find the solution. And he hears that Jesus is coming. I'm saying this because I want you to hear the news. Jesus is coming now to your city. Jesus is coming to your life. For Zacchaeus, this was a chance. He's saying, I want to, he must have had something that he wanted to tell Jesus. And Jesus comes, stops at that tree. He says, Zacchaeus, my heart would have just burst open. How do you know my name? And then he, Jesus goes one more step and he says, come down, I'm going to go to your house. Jesus, please believe that Jesus tells you today, you might have been lost, you might have been hated, you might have been in trouble, but he comes to you today. He says, such as us, Zacchaeus, I want to come, to come home to you, and I want to live with you. And look at the reactions of the people. You know, this is very interesting because, you know, there's not much explanation, but from the actions and the words, we see their intention. Verse 7, Luke chapter 19, verse 7. When they saw it, they all began to grumble. They all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. This word grumble in Greek is diagongutso. Diagongutso means to gossip, grumble, complain, to express discontent with an emphatic, in an emphatic way. Have you ever done this before? To express discontent in an emphatic way. How do you do that? <laughs> Don't do that here. I get scared. They began to grumble. I think some of the things that I would have said would be like, it's not fair. Is he really Jesus the Messiah? Does he even know what this man Zacchaeus has been doing? Does he know that there are more desperate people, people who are sick, people who are poor, people who, who really need him? But why is he going to his house? Does he know what he's doing? Who are they complaining about? Who am I complaining about in this context? About Jesus? Why is he going to that house? He's a sinner. Why is he favoring him? He already had enough of favor from the Romans. Didn't you come here to save us? You came to save us. Why are you saving him? He's a sinner. You have to condemn him and rebuke him and throw him out so that he doesn't collect our blood-stained money tax anymore. Don't you agree with me? Okay. But John chapter 2, verse 45 and 40, 40, uh, 24 and 25, John chapter 2, 24 and 25 says, Jesus knows the hearts of the people. Jesus need, knows really needs him. And what does Zacchaeus tell him? Zacchaeus tells him, Behold, Lord, half of my possession I will, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anybody of anything, I will give back four times as much. That's a bold statement. Do you think that would come like, you know, save, save the moment kind of thing? People are complaining, oh, okay, let, let, me, let me say something that's, you know, that's glorious and honorable. They're hating me. They're gossiping about Jesus and me. And so, say, Jesus, I'll give you money. Is that what Zacchaeus was doing? No, Zacchaeus, do you know what happens if he gives half of his asset, his, his wealth, to the poor? 
and gives that four times the defaulted money, what happens to him, do you think? It doesn't matter how rich he is, he's lost 50% already, or he's given away 50%. And I don't know how much he has defrauded, but he must have for people to hate him so much. Four times, he will lose his job as a tax collector. He will probably lose his house. Right? He will lose his reputation. He will lose his status. He will lose everything. Do you think you can say that to save the moment kind of thing? No, this is his confession. Jesus, I know I've done, I've lived my life in the wrong way. Now I repent by, sh by really living out my repentance. This is true repentance. Jesus, I'm not just going to say I'm sorry and live the same way. I will change my life. This is, I, I believe this is why he was seeking to meet Jesus. So that he can sit and tell Jesus, Jesus this. From other people's point of view, they probably thought, ah, he's, he's bogus. He's just saying that. Let's see if he's really going to do that. He's saying that to save the woman right now. Save himself. Save his face. And then what does Jesus say? After hearing that, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, salvation has come into this house. What will people think? Ah, now that he's paying, Jesus brings salvation. He talks about giving money and Jesus brings salvation. Is that what's happening? Jesus sees the heart. Jesus knows this repentance is genuine and true. That's why Jesus came to him. To whom would Jesus come? Those who are tired. Zacchaeus must have been so tired of living in the wrong way. Those who are tired in the world. Those who are rejected. Those who are not liked. Look at the Canaanite woman. Look at the Samaritan woman. Look at this Zacchaeus. Are you that one today? I believe Jesus will come to you. Maybe you don't want him to come. But he will come to you to say amen. <laughs> Who are the real lost ones? Jesus came to find the lost ones, those who are lost. But the true lost, the truly lost ones, really lost ones, were not these people. Because these people weren't found by Jesus. During that time, the Jews believed murderers, thieves, prostitutes, and tax collectors were the greatest sinners. They were, the, they were what is called the outcasts. They were not included into the the flow of the society, they were rejected. They were not recognized. Basically, they had no hope of, of, of being recognized by the people again. And who were the ones that hated them the most? It's the scribes, the Sadducees, the, the Pharisees. Those who claim to have the greatest faith. So Jesus, you have to kind of look at this whole thing, uh, the Lucan passage. From chapter 15 is about the, the, the lost, one lost sheep out of the hundred, right? This is the parable, about one lost coin out of the ten coins, one lost son, prodigal son, out of the two sons. Do you remember? And Jesus is emphasizing the importance of the lost one. And he's telling us, I have come to find that lost one. Because that one that is lost, that needs to be found for the entire group to be completed. Our church will only be completed with that lost one that you need to go find, that we need to go find, is found. And then chapter 16, Jesus speaks about the Pharisees. And he says, chapter 16, verse 14, 
Now the Pharisees, who are lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. He goes on, this chapter 17, chapter 18, verse, uh, verse 9 through 14. Chapter 18, verse 9 through 14, I'll read it for you, though it's a bit uh, in length. And he also told his, this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Let us ask ourselves, are we this kind of people who consider ourselves righteous but view others in with contempt? Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. From the Jewish point of view, who is the righteous one? The Pharisee. The tax collector is a sinner. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a, a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but was beating his, heart, his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell, I tell you, this man went to his house justified. Jesus is speaking about this tax collector. This man went to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's chapter 18. In chapter 19, he actually goes to a tax collector who is Zacchaeus, and he saves him. And then chapter 20, verse 45 through 47. Luke chapter 20, verse 45 through 47. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses. What uh, Jesus explains in Matthew and Mark, when a, a, pers a, a person's husband dies and she becomes a widow, the Pharisees go to um, visitation to the house to counsel them and so on. But then in the end, they, they want the, the wealth, the asset the husband left behind. So they devour widows' houses. And for appearance sake, offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. What is Jesus telling us through this, these passages of Luke that he wants? Zacchaeus was a believer. The other people in the city of Jericho were believers. The Pharisees are believers. We see at least three different kinds of believers here in this, in this story today. Let us ask ourselves, what kind of believer am I? Am I a true, sincere believer that is really in trouble, really repentant, that really seeks to meet Jesus? Or are we like the crowd that is just curious and grumbling when I don't get the attention? Or are we like the Pharisees that condemn and that live this religion? They, they, they practice this religion to exalt themselves for their own gain. What is the reason why we believe? Status? Identity? Curiosity? Just a chance and possibility that God might actually be alive or that there actually might be heaven. For Zacchaeus, it was the only and the last chance in his life to get things back, to, to, to bring things back. As I had mentioned earlier, what he volunteered to do, giving half of his asset, four times the defrauded, defrauded money. He may lose everything. Even then, he still wanted to see Jesus. He was just happy that Jesus called his name. 
and came to his house. Zacchaeus was a person who was in the wrong place. He was not doing the right things. He was not liked by people. And he did not have good looks. How do we, Christians, or how do we, Zion Church, treat Zacchaeus as a normal? I began this sermon by asking the question, what does God want from us? And we answered the question, God's will is for at least that one more person to be saved, to come to believe in Jesus Christ, to confess that Jesus is their Lord. Are we helping him? Or are we blaming? Why is that kind of person in this church or in, in believing in Jesus? Why is Jesus going into that sinner's house? Let us realize, church is a junkyard. Can you say that? Church is a junkyard. Yes, it's not easy to say. It feels like you're, you're condemning or you're cursing this church. Our God is a junk collector. Reverend Abraham Park once wrote a poem saying, God the junk collector. Why is it a junkyard? Because this is a gathering of people who are rejected from the world, people who are, who are sinners, people who are tired, exhausted, sick, and troubled. And he collects those junk souls but then he renews them, makes them into diamonds, makes them into beautiful stars. And have you ever seen a, a, a anybody go to a junkyard? What's a junkyard? It's, I'm thinking about of a, a place where all the old, uh, you know, useless cars are junked, right? Have you seen anybody going to a junkyard and complaining that there is no new Mercedes in this place? How come all the cars here in the junkyard are useless and dirty and used up and I cannot, I cannot pick anyone? It's foolish to say that. It's foolish to expect righteous, righteous people in the church because we are a gathering of sinners or ex-sinners. And now have been renewed. Zacchaeus, a moment ago, when he was climbing the tree versus now when Jesus met him are two different people. Church is a place where junk comes in and becomes new. It's magic. It's amazing. But we are human beings. We still have our old habits. We still have our sinful nature. And we are in the process of getting better and better day by day. And so when new people come, when our brothers and sisters make mistakes, this is a place to make mistakes. This is a place to confess our sins and be forgiven. This is not a place where all professionals and best workers and best communicators, the best kind of people gather. That would be called, what, I don't know, Apple, Google, Samsung. Nice corporations that do interviews to pick the best, you know, cream of the crop. Or is that how you say it? But church is not a place like that. As conclusion, we have to remember when we were sent. And now that we have been accepted, we have been given a place of a pastor, elder, elders, deacon, leader, or a church member. The gl most glorious name, Christian, son of God, daughter of God. Let us ask ourselves, God, what can I do now? Zacchaeus promised half of his wealth and four times. God, this is what I want to do. I want to find another Zacchaeus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. We were lost sheep. We were that lost coin. We were, you were that lost one. But Jesus said, you are the one that I believe in. Jesus is asking us today, do you believe in me? You can respond in your heart. And my answer is, yes, Lord. Jesus says, then there is one thing that I would like for you to do. What is it? Spread the gospel. Just as I came to save you, you be the deliverer, the messenger of my love to that one that is lost, whether in the church or outside. That is the one that you're looking for, that I'm looking for. That's my greatest desire and wish. Jesus, after his death on the cross and resurrection, the first thing and the final thing when he was going up to heaven, Matthew 28, 18-20, he says, go out, spread the gospel, make disciples of all nations. That's the reason why Zion Church is so focused on going out to spread the word. Not for our gain, but for their salvation. For people to not just have Faith out on, the, on the, the, the facade or or just the name that they are Christians. But for people to really meet Jesus, to be able to find Jesus in the Bible and find Jesus in their life. So that they can have a true, real, genuine relationship with Jesus. That is our goal. For us to Jesus is not just a name out there. It's not just a religion that we choose out of the many. To cry out to them, He is alive. He is amongst us. He's still working. He still saves. If we cannot really show that in our lives, we need to pray. God, allow me to live with you. Allow Jesus to be alive in my life. So that people around me can see you in, at, at work in my life. So that I can share with other people. It's not about teachings only. It's about bringing Jesus into their life. What's the use of church growing to hundreds of thousands of numbers, of members, if it's just for attending church? unless every member can really walk with Jesus. I pray and bless you in the name of the Lord that you and I will really think about this and think about how to find Zacchaeus. And may Zacchaeus be a place where all these Zacchaeuses can be called and meet Jesus Christ. Let us pray.